Okay, you can take it away when you're ready. Great. Good morning, everybody. So this morning I will be talking about neural networks and the Bayesian posterior. So our aim for this talk is going to be to use a concrete example of neural networks, which are strictly singular models and therefore interesting to singular learning theory or interesting examples of where singular learning theory is useful. Um, using these, we will introduce the posterior and the free energy. thus explaining the intuitive understanding of Watanabe's main formula or main free energy formula, which is free energy is N times the min log loss, negative log loss, LNW plus the RLCT times log N. So our aim will be to explain this formula with um, the uh, plots that you see are already up in the world over there, which I spent a long time on for my thesis. Um, and what we will see, the upshot of this, will be that in singular models, non true parameters can be preferred or can nonetheless be preferred Oops. be preferred by the posterior. That is to say that in regular models when the complexity is only measured in terms of the total number of parameters in the model, we should usually prefer that model which has the best accuracy, which is to say the lowest log loss, negative log loss. But in singular models, this free energy formula will tell us that sometimes parameters that are not um, the minimizers of the negative log loss can nonetheless be preferred by the posterior. Cool. So I'm going to hop over to the next board just for the sake of having everything on the same one. Okay. So first of all, feed forward ReLU neural networks. So I will briefly introduce this uh, architecture of neural network, which is quite simple compared to um, architectures that are used in modern deep learning practice. But ReLU is a very common activation function that is used and these offer a good starting point and they are also, um, well, they are tractable in that we can actually calculate um, the set of true parameters of simple versions of these models, which is a tick. We can't necessarily apply all of Watanabe's theory to it. We can't calculate the RLCT particularly easily, um, but they are a good starting point. So, definition. A, so I'll abbreviate, this is feed forward ReLU neural network. Feed forward ReLU neural network is a function from the space of inputs times the space of parameters. So this is the number of inputs into the statistical model. This is the parameter space, W, 
function from these two spaces to an output space where m is the number of outputs of the model which we represent as a graph. So a typical neural network graph oops, will look like the following. We have a few inputs, which then connect to a hidden layer of nodes, where these connections represent the composition of an affine function with the ReLU function. So I'll write that down a bit more precisely in a second, but for the sake of the graph, we can have uh, a number of hidden layers. Hidden layer L minus one, where each successive, each successive um, layer is another composition of affine functions with uh, the ReLU. So it might come in like this. And then we have an output layer, which will be M outputs. So these layers can have different widths and that is part of the network architecture. Um, so we represent the neural network as this graph, which induces a function that looks like the following. So these L's here denote affine functions, which is to say, have the form, or oh, apologies, where each affine is parameterized by weights, WL, which are effectively the gradients, and biases, noted BL, thus giving rise to an affine function that looks like the following. Where Z is some vector. So the, um, uh, the domain of these affine functions is the number of nodes of the layer that it is referring to and the um, dimension of the output of these affine functions is the layer that it might be going to, for instance. So, and here we have, for those that haven't seen it before, ReLU of x is defined to be x when x is greater than or equal to zero and zero otherwise. And so it looks like the following. which is clearly non-linear. So what this means is that these functions ultimately arise as piecewise hyperplanes. Um, and we will see an example of this when I come to the experiments at the end. Uh, so Yes, and I'll also note that the ReLU function here is vectorized in that above definition, which is to say that the ReLU applied to some vector is just ReLU of each component. Like that. Great. So 
These are our feedforward ReLU neural networks and they are going to be the concrete example that we will look at today. So I'll hop over to the next board to start explaining how we can set this up as a regression model. So we want to, or we will, Watanabe does, package this up as a model truth prior triple, where each of these will be denoted by the following notations. So to start with, the truth, we suppose that we have identically, independently, uh, sorry, IID, what does it stand for? Identically, independently distributed data, IID, data, DN, oops, I always hit that jump button. DN of input output pairs. So for example, it might be the inputs could be the um, uh, pixels of a picture and the output might be the animal that is in that picture. So a dog, a cat, a monkey, whatever. This data is supposed to be drawn from an unknown true distribution, which is what we wish to model. Whoops. Ooh, can I get rid of that big line? Yeah, cool. Unknown true distribution denoted Q of Y given X. Um, so I won't mention this in great detail here, but um, we do suppose that we know the input distribution Q of X. So it is the conditional distribution of the outputs given the input that we suppose we don't know, which is what we wish to model. So then the model Given some neural network function, a feed for the running neural network function, f of xw, the regression model is given by the following. So it is a probability distribution on the space of outputs, which is equal to the function, the neural network function, plus some noise parameter, which is oops, distributed with, say, a standard normal distribution. So as a density, that simply pops out as being the exponential negative a half, the Euclidean norm of Y minus the neural network's output, where that norm is taken over the space of inputs. Because we recall that Y is an element of R to the M. So the regression model, I. I like looking at that first form of it a bit better. The second one is you know, obviously easily as interpretable, but the first one really tells you that the regression model is saying, we do think it's this neural network, but we add some, um, some standard noise to it, 
for uh, to keep it within Bayesian statistics, I guess. Um, yeah, so thus for any given W, for any parameter, it is a prob density on output space. And then uh, I'll note here as well that the regression model is very standard with it within statistics and the starting point for anyone learning about it would be linear regression. So you suppose that f of x w is mx plus c or w1 x plus w2. Um, and what is really interesting about this in our context is that it is the properties of the function of f x of of f x w that determines whether the model is regular or strictly singular. So a linear regression model is not strictly singular, it is just a regular model. And so Watanabe's theory applies to it, but it doesn't really have anything particularly interesting to say about it that standard statistics doesn't already tell us. However, feed-forward ReLU neural networks are in fact strictly singular models, which I will state in a second. So it is the properties of FXW that we are particularly interested in. The final part of this triple is the prior, which is according to Caselis and Berger, a subjective distribution, oops, distribution of parameters W based on the experimenters prior beliefs about what they think the parameters should be. So standard one is to say that the prior is just a standard normal distribution. And I think it is worth pointing out here that I'm going to say typically because I don't know all of the literature quite well enough to make a full assertion about this, but typically asymptotic results about the posterior are independent of the exact form of the prior. Which I think is important to note because what that tells us is that we don't necessarily care so much about what the prior is in um, or as the number of training samples goes to infinity. It's mainly important for when we have finite samples, which is always, but <laughs> always in practice, but nonetheless, this is the picture that you want to have in your head. Um, cool. All right, I'll hop over to the next board. Yeah, so I can see comments from Mathematical there, um, which I think is Matt. <laughs> uh, some things matter. Example, the prior should not be zero in important places. Yes, so at a theoretical level, the prior certainly matters for things like that. I guess my emphasis there is that the precise form of the prior, what you choose what the experimenter chooses to be the prior um, before they have seen any experimental data is not necessarily important in the asymptotics beyond theoretical considerations about where it is zero and that kind of thing. But if you're taking a prior on, the, on all of um, 
all of the real numbers, for instance, with a standard normal, then it doesn't matter whether you're taking the normal with a standard deviation of one or of 10, etc. These are all irrelevant in the long run. So why do we care about these feed forward ReLU neural networks? Well, as I said before, they are a good starting point for understanding um, uh, modern deep learning architectures, but in particular, under the regression model, they are strictly, strictly singular. which is to say they have a degenerate Fisher information matrix. That is the Fisher information matrix, which Edmund spoke about last week, which has the form, once you do a few calculations and simplify it down a bit, has the form of the following. is degenerate. So a strictly singular model is one in which the Fisher information matrix is degenerate, or at least that is the interesting case. So as I say, the upshot of this is that singular learning theory is necessary to understand the statistical properties of feed forward ReLU neural networks and most other neural networks as well. Things like the TAN-H neural network and that kind of thing. Great, so I'm not gonna bother proving this today. Um, I can send a link to it later because really what I wanna do today is give you the intuition for the main formula. So to get to the main formula, we have to now go through the Bayesian posterior. So, the Bayesian posterior, which is a probability function on the space of parameters that I spoke about last week in the lead up to uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. The Bayesian posterior, given our data, is written as follows. So the probability of the data set times the prior divided by what's called the evidence. But we can simplify this. And I should say that unsurprisingly, this um, posterior form is called the Bayesian posterior because it uses Bayes' rule to get there. So we can simplify this because each data point that we have from the truth is IID and therefore that first term, the probability of the data given our parameter of choice, which is, I should say, this is the model here. This is simply equal to the product of the model evaluated at all of our different data points. And then since the denominator there, the evidence term does not depend on W. So that means it is essentially just a normalizing constant so that the posterior itself is a probability distribution. That evidence term is given by an integral over parameter space of what is on the top there. The model times the prior. So 
This means that we can rewrite the posterior. I'm thinking whether I do it on this board or the next one. Um, I might start on this one. So the posterior is given by the following formula. Zn times the prior e to the negative n l n w, where these new objects here are simply ln of w is the negative log likelihood and is given by the following formula, which is the Apologies for the crammed writing down here, which is the mean squared error between the outputs that we know and what the neural network predicts, plus a constant. So ln of w is one of the more important objects in all of this setup because, as you can see, it is the mean squared error and thus is sort of the first First thing that we wish to, um, we don't necessarily wish to minimize it, as we will see, but we want it to be pretty good, right? You want the model to fit the data pretty well. And Zn there is essentially just the evidence term that I have said above, but we call it the partition function coming from uh, statistical physics. So. It is, again, the normalizing factor is the partition function. Great. Okay. So the posterior tells us which parameters W or which regions of parameter space are most likely to uh, fit the data of our data set dn. And so regions of uh, or compact subsets of parameter space that have good models will have greater posterior density. So I will make sense of this on the next slide, but that's the picture that I want you to have in your head. We're looking for regions of posterior density in our search for good models. Um, Great, so let me move on to the next slide. Okay, so this brings us to the free energy. So the free energy is simply an adjusted or an effective Hamiltonian of the posterior density. So really we just define this for theoretical reasons, but you should have in your head that the free energy is essentially equivalent to posterior density, but uh, sort of flipped. So the free energy of a compact subset of parameter space is given by Fn of that space, negative log of the partition function over that space, which is to say negative log of the integral of the model times the prior over that subset. subset. I will also remark here that not only is it convenient for theoretical reasons to consider the free energy in this form, that is, uh, but the generalization loss, which I won't define precisely here simply because it is a bit of a tangent, you've got to go through the Bayes predictive distribution to do it in the what in the way 
Watanabe does, but the generalization loss is the average increase in free energy with n, with the number of training samples. So that is to say that the free energy is very much related to the generalization loss of models in, in the region, um, MathCal W. So this brings us to Watanabe's free energy formula. So the key point of Watanabe's work, which we are going to discuss in great depth in future seminars, but I will simply brush over today and introduce the intuition for, is that model complexity in singular models is measured by Oops, measured by the real log canonical threshold denoted lambda, which is a positive rational number. So the theorem, which is in Watanabe's 2009 book, main formula number two, states that in singular models, as the number of training samples, denoted little n, tends to infinity, asymptotically, the free energy satisfies the following formula. N times the minimum of the negative log likelihood plus lambda log N. So, and here I should say that we're assuming as above that MathCal W is some compact subset of parameter space. So, What I like to call these two terms, there are a few ways of going about it, but this first term here is essentially the error term of the best parameter in the space that we are considering, in the subset that we are considering, I should say. So uh, that is to say that the free energy is comprised of the accuracy and the complexity. So this term I think of as complexity. In a physical sense, one can also think of this first term as being the energy of the system and this second term as being the entropy. So, Recall that the negative log likelihood is the mean squared error in, uh, between the predicted output and the measured output from our data set. And so the free energy is comprised of minimizing that mean squared error and the complexity of the most singular point in the space that we're considering in the subset. So remarks here. What is this RLCT? So I think the easiest way to interpret the RLCT is by saying that two lambda is the effective number of parameters near the most singular point most singular 
which which I'll put in quotation marks as well. Most singular point of our subset. So that is to say model complexity is essentially the number of parameters in the model. But the point is that in singular models, we can have models that have an effective number of parameters that is much less than the true number of parameters afforded to the model. So for regular models, lambda is equal to d over 2, where d is the number of parameters afforded to the model. But in singular models, the RLCT is in general less than or equal to d over 2. So I'll go to the next board. So the upshot of this formula is that suppose we have two sets, two subsets, W1, which has low error, which we will denote by this. So the, the subscript W0 here is just shorthand for saying the minimum attainable error over our subset. Suppose it has low error, but high complexity. So suppose that the RLCT, the effective number of parameters, is high, but that we have another subset, W2, which has a higher error, but lower complexity. So it might not fit the data as precisely as models from MathCal W1, but uh, it has a lower complexity, which is to say it might generalize the data better. Then the formula says that because of this trade-off between error and complexity, it is possible for W2 to have lower free energy despite being less accurate. So having higher error. So I will remark here that the that saying this precisely um, is a yeah, I need to be careful with my words here, but saying this precisely does depend on a bit of a conjecture from Watanabe and really what the story that I'm telling here is more about what you're about to see in the plots. So Watanabe's work currently only deals with the case where these regions contain some true parameter and thus minimize the negative log likelihood, minimize the error. But we can see in the experiments that I'm about to show you that it seems to be, at least in what I've considered, it seems to be true when it doesn't necessarily contain a true parameter as well. And that's the intuition that I want to build. So, um, yeah, so this fact is a key feature of strictly singular models. The effective number of parameters are more flexible in these singular models than in regular models, meaning a posterior can concentrate around models that generalize better even if they are less accurate.
So, we're nearly up to the experiments. Let me just explain what we're going to be looking at. Neural network posteriors using... Hey, Liam, quick question. Yep. So, um, it's not really unique to singular models that a lower number of parameters might have higher error but better generalization. Um, for example, that's the case with polynomial regression. Um, you know, you get really crazy fits that match the data perfectly well with a high degree polynomial, but um, you're fitting to the noise, and so you're better off with a lower complexity model, um, even at the cost of some training error. So what's the difference here? What is singular learning theory saying that's um, more than that? Yeah, it's a good question. So the way that I like to think about it is in terms of this term flexibility, which at the moment sounds a bit imprecise, but some sort of kind of self-organizing principle in a sense. So essentially what my interpretation of what singularity gives you is that you've got the flexibility with the model to, um, to have a model that has a very low or has a lower effective number of parameters in it. And that varies across the space of parameters. That varies across W. Whereas you can only get flexibility in something like polynomial regression if you are, say, the experimenter sitting there at your computer iterating over, I'm going to choose a polynomial of degree 2, degree 3, degree 4, degree 5. So I like to think of it as this kind of self-organization where the posterior itself can decide what it thinks the um, best effective number of parameters is to have and that differs across the space of parameters whereas that's not true in polynomial regression or any other regular kind of regular model which is to say that d is always fixed whereas lambda varies across the space of parameters in singular models. I see. Um, that makes some sense. So in polynomial regression, you're right, model selection, I think is what you would call that practitioner, mm -hmm. changing the degree of the polynomial. Um, and then they're left with a choice to make of which one to choose. And so are you suggesting that um, what's now based theory puts forward a uh, principle for model selection? Yes. Yeah, I would say so. Great. Right. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. No worries. And perhaps Dan will have some thoughts on that at the end as well. We'll see. I would have interrupted if I thought your answer wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> cool. The fact I haven't heard from you yet is very nice. <laughs> okay, so recall from last week that Markov chain Monte Carlo, or also Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, that I talked about, so in supplementary two, is an algorithm for sampling from the posterior P of W given DN. So we expect these samples to concentrate in regions of, there's an equivalence to have in your head here. So we expect them, we expect the samples that we get from Markov chain Monte Carlo to concentrate in regions of high posterior density which is to say low free energy 
which is to say low generalization error understood in the correct sense, which is to say good models, which is to say low error and low complexity. But as we have seen from the trade-off where we have the free energy is equal to error plus complexity, um, there might be a trade-off between error. So they don't necessarily have to be the lowest error or the lowest complexity, but it is the sum of those uh, appropriately scaled by n and log n. All right, so in our example, um, I might go on to the next board. In our example, we will have a model that is a two layer feed forward ReLU neural network with two nodes. Oops two nodes, two inputs, one output, which is a function of the following form. So here, these cues out the front are also weights, but I, in my thesis, I have notated them as cues taking from, oops, I forgot the cue at the front there, um, simply for uh, ease of notation, but we don't need to worry too much about them in this anyway. And the C there is also a bias. So this is the form of our model where these weight vectors are two-dimensional vectors, the Q's, the B's, and the C are all single dimension. And our truth will be the same, but we will deform, we will deform it from a distribution that requires two nodes to one that only requires one node to fully express the distribution. That is to say that our truth is realizable by the model, thus the set of true parameters, which is the minimizers of the coolback Leibler divergence, which when you carry out a calculation shows you that it is the set of parameters such that the model is equal to the truth, is non-empty. So there do exist parameters that minimize the coolback Leibler divergence. Okay, the final thing to say is that when we are reading the plots, I've spoken about these experiments a good few times now and every time that I get to this bit, I'm like, oh, how do I, how do I simplify the, um, some of the complexity that's going on in what these plots are actually showing? But I will just put it to you that to read the plots, we have a posterior of weights with the first dimension on the x-axis and the second dimension on the y-axis, such that these weights are normalized. So we actually only care about what I denote W hat, 
which is normalized by the scale factor out the front. So this is essentially saying that the posteriors are of the effective gradient. And we can do this because these neural networks satisfy a scaling symmetry. That means that the posterior is, well not the posterior, sorry, but the function is invariant under this kind of scaling transformation, which is actually, I should say, what gives the degeneracy of the Fisher information matrix. This scaling symmetry is kind of the essence of the singularity structure of um, these two layer feed forward rally neural networks. And we will also have these two nodes, these two effective weights, I should say, superimposed onto the same plots. And we can do this because there is a permutation symmetry in the nodes in our model. Okay, so I can mention a bit more about that when we're actually looking at the plots, but I reckon now is a good time to run over to the experiments. Okay, so you can see here on this first board, we've got the true network. Oh, well, we've got the model, which is what I wrote on the other board. And the true network that we are um, using here is a two layer, two node feed forward rally neural network where the when theta is zero, looks like this first plot here. So this is the function itself. This is a contour plot of the true network. And so we can see here that it definitely requires two nodes to describe it because, um, uh, because we have two activation boundaries, which are these lines here where the node goes from being inactive, which is when ReLU is composed with a negative number versus active, which is when the inside here is positive. So we start with something that requires two nodes, and then we slowly deform this true distribution as follows. So you can see here, we increase theta to pi on four, and it is still a distribution that requires two nodes. But then at precisely theta equals pi on two, this true distribution actually only requires one node. So what we are saying here is we are going to see whether the posterior prefers parameters that have one node being active and the second weight is zero or whether it prefers a more complex model where both weights are non-zero. So intuitively, we look at this first plot down here, the A degen, and think that that has less effective parameters in it. That only has, um, well, it only has one effective node, which is to say three effective parameters. W11, W12, and the uh, bias of that node. Everything else can be zero. Whereas this second, second distribution is expressing precisely the same function, but with a more complicated model. It is using two nodes to describe it. And so our question is, which does the posterior prefer? Now you should be thinking to yourself, based on the free energy formula, it should prefer the one with lower model complexity, which is to say we expect it to prefer the first one here, A degen, where one node is active and the other one is zero. The other question we might ask ourselves is in between here, 
is there some theta value where we still require two nodes to precisely express the true distribution. However, the posterior actually prefers one node, which is to say, does it ever prefer a one node configuration because of having a lower complexity, despite two being strictly necessary to have the maximum attainable accuracy? that is to say, the lowest error. So without further ado, I think we can hop over to the posterior plots over here. So just tell me when you want to move between them, yeah? Yep. Great. So here, the red dots indicate the two arrows that you can see in that first theta equals zero board over there. Um, here theta is 1.08 just because there's not much that happens in between theta equals zero and theta equals 1.08. A lot of the interesting stuff happens from here on in. So this is saying that for sufficiently low theta, the posterior act absolutely prefers having two nodes because a one node distribution here is very inaccurate. If we then scroll forward the next one, we start to see here that the posterior still prefers having two nodes, but these, <laughs> I am without a pen here, so hopefully everyone can orally interpret what I'm saying, but these two smaller regions of concentration that are about the origin and sort of 0 0.2 or 0 0.1.5, that is, referring to a configuration with only one node. So where one of the weights is zero, hence the origin, and one is two, so one plus one, which are the other nodes. Um, and so we can see here that it still prefers a two node configuration because the accuracy sort of requires it to, um, because a one node would still have too much error, but there is still a small amount of posterior concentration for this one node um, configuration. And if we flick to the next one, we start to see what this energy entropy or error complexity trade-off is starting to look like. So here we can see that the trade-off is pretty similar between the two. So the regions where the red dots are which are the two node configurations is approximately equal to, or has free energy approximately equal to that of the one node. So the one node configuration is still less accurate, but the complexity is starting to trade off in a way that the free energy is actually starting to be lower here than for the two node configuration. And if we keep going, Was that, oh, yeah, cool. We can see this same trade-off occurring again. And if we keep going once more, we really start to see that the posterior is really starting to prefer the one node configuration now. Yet at this theta value, it is still uh, not as accurate as the two node one, but it is still nonetheless being preferred by that, by the, sorry, by the one node configuration. What am I saying? The one node configuration is being preferred by the posterior here is what I meant to say. So that actually answers our second question. Does it ever prefer a one node configuration even if it's less accurate, even if it doesn't contain a true parameter? According to this plot, yes, it does. And if we continue on, we just see the same trend occurring. And if Dan scrolls right through to the end here in a nice slow fashion, we get to theta equals pi on two, where we see that it dramatically prefers 
the one node configuration to the two node, which answers our first question. Which configuration does the posterior prefer? Well, it prefers the one with the lower free energy, which is the one with lower model complexity, which here is the one node configuration. So if we go over to the final board here, we can see this trade-off in flight. So this first, these plots were designed for my thesis, not for the talk, so some of the labeling might seem a bit abstract. Essentially what you want to think of here is the relative density of the two configurations. So recall that degen is saying the one node, non-degen is the two node. So matching what we saw on those posterior plots, we see that at theta equals about 1.26, there was an exchange, there was a phase transition where the one node configuration became more preferred by the posterior. And so this is the error down here. And if we map that to this lower plot, what we see is that it sort of roughly equates to when the error of the two regions became comparable. So theoretically, the error of the one node was always going to be worse, but because of the fact that we were taking a finite sample of data points and because the regions where they differ were narrowing each time we increased theta, there did become a point where the errors were comparable to one another, which meant that the posterior started to prefer the one node configuration with the lower complexity, which you can see happens about here. And so for these subsequent values, um, the errors start to be very similar to one another. I reckon that might just be that, that, yeah, that, I think probably that probably suits the time as well. Sorry, Matt, go for it. In that last plot, are you plotting like a, some kind of theoretical error of the sample where you force it to do either one or two parameters? Uh, so this last plot here is a numerical calculation of the error of samples from the two different regions in the posterior that we saw on the other page. Oh, okay. okay, so I guess that's effectively. Some of the, that, um, the posterior were sampled as in, uh, you built them out of a whole lot of different runs of this training algorithm or sampling algorithm. Yes. So you could yep. pick one where, it, in that case, it did happen to choose, say, towards the end, you did happen to choose the two parameter solution and then you computed the error of that. That makes sense. Sorry, what was the last bit there? So I'm wondering, my fundamental question is how did you get these errors? How did you how did you get the data for this plot? And right. I think yeah. I understand what you're saying is you you went into individual runs from which you built the posterior, and some of them happen to be either in the degenerate region or the non-degenerate region, and use the empirical error from those runs, and you put that on this plot. Precisely. Yep, absolutely spot on. So right. just for ease of um, explanation, in fact, I might just do it on here. So essentially, um, I did a form of, um, I guess, just kind of, uh, it wasn't quite clustering analysis, but something sort of similar. So if we have the posteriors on this plot here, one region corresponded to an annulus that looked like the following. So the degenerate region was 
uh, models that came from this region and about the origin, whereas the non-degenerate region was essentially the in-between here. And so the errors and these density plots um, at the top here were obtained by taking all of the samples in these two regions and calculating the relative density in the first case and the negative log likelihood in the second. Cool. Has anyone else got any other questions? If not, um, thanks a lot, Liam. I guess you're going to stick around for a bit. People can ask you more questions, but I will take this opportunity to initiate So please don't make too much foliage near the boards in case people want to keep talking about the content here. But you'll notice <laughs> that one of these guns will, uh, will improve the garden status of the world. <laughs>